Welcome, everybody, to Survive in Advance on the Gruley Crew Sports Network. I'm your co-host for Survive in Advance, Mike Goodpasser. Right now, I'd like to welcome in my co-host, a member of the Indiana Basketball Hall of Fame, 1981 National Champion with Bob Knight's Indiana Hoosiers. Help me welcome to the show, as always, Steve Risley. How you doing, Steve? Doing great this morning, Mike. Good to be on board. Oh, you're not going to give me a weather report since you live in sunny California and I live in uh, Indiana, I, I guess. You know, you know what, what am I going to say? I'm going to say it's 75 and sunny. I mean, it's like... What the heck? <laughs> All right. <laughs> Special guest today. He was here a few months ago. He is the commissioner of the XFL. Had a big announcement last week. We're going to talk about that and which way the XFL is going. Help me welcome to the show, Oliver Luck. How you doing, Oliver? Mike, I'm doing great, Steve. How are you? Doing wonderful. Awesome. Well, that is the quickest Steve's ever responded to something. Usually we get a three-minute dissertation, so I don't you know, know what's I up. Just, yeah, I, but I, 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 have, just, I would rather hear all of the luck talk than me, so I'm going to shut up through a lot of this. Well, I'll, I'll also say, uh, you know, congrats, uh, Steve, on IU's performance so far. They're looking like a basketball team this year, which is nice for all you Hoosier fans. Yeah, it's yes. just good to be relevant again, isn't it? It's, it's yeah. good, good for Archie Miller, good for the program, good for all the Hoosier Nation. Um, you know, it's a long time coming. We aren't out of the woods yet, but yeah, we're getting better. But thank you for that. All right. So last week, Oliver, we had the announcement on the cities that are going to be in. It was Houston, Dallas, LA, New York, Seattle, St. Louis, Tampa, and Washington. And the question is why all big cities that already have NFL teams? So I think the answer to that really goes back to the rationale that you know Vince and we all have for our league, which is that there are you know tens of millions of diehard, passionate football fans who love the game. For them, right, and I include myself in that group, and I dare say the two of you are in that group, right? Uh, you know, for all of us, right? There's that void that exists after the completion of the NFL season, after the Super Bowl. And that, you know, our league really is designed to uh, appeal to those passionate fans as well as others, but for that passionate group of fans who have told us through all the research we've done that they will, they want more football, they will consume more football. That means, you know, both going to games, buying tickets, watching at home, you know, talking about it, playing fantasy, you name it. Uh, so, you know, we believe that uh, there's a lot of those types of fans in the larger markets, in the NFL markets, right? Every one of our markets is an NFL market aside from St. Louis, which, of course, used to be an NFL market. So I think it really goes back to the sort of the underlying rationale, you know, behind the league, which is, you know, let's, let's, let's put together a league that really will appeal with good, crisp football appeal to all these diehard football fans. So I think, you know, at the end of the day that a lot of our fans who will be watching the XFL franchises, you know, will be season ticket holders of, you know, the NFL club in that market. In, in Dallas, it will be Cowboys season ticket holders, as well as season ticket holders for, you know, many of the college programs in, in, uh, in and around Dallas. So I think that's really the, I think the, the simplest answer to the question. All right. So the thing is, it seems like everything's picking up a lot more rapidly for you guys. You're about a little over a year away from your start. Um, what I did read, which the question was, each franchise will hire a starting quarterback – who will each be paid up to $300,000 annually. How will the selection process go for that? Will you have a quarterback draft, or will each team individually try to sign a quarterback? So uh, the, the next – so this, this step that we had, uh, you know, with the city and stadium announcements, that was obviously a big milestone. Our next big milestone probably is going to be our head coaches. So uh, I've been spending, gosh, the bulk of my time over the last couple of months – talking to prospective head coaches, we want to uh, offer uh, head coaching positions to our, you know, our, our respective eight head coaches beginning very early in January, sort of once you know, Black Monday happens and, and the, the, the deck is reshuffled a little bit, right? So uh, that's the next big step. We'll, we'll, we will work with those head coaches to identify uh, the quarterbacks that we think uh, can be our premier players, can be our star player for each of our teams. And then now, we'll, hey, I've got, 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 got a couple good. questions here on that. On that. But first off, I, I know Mike's going to throw two names out real quick that he, he would like you to consider for head coaches. One would be Marvin Lewis, and one would be Hugh Jackson. <laughs> yeah, I'll take them both. <laughs> I Please. think he wants to see the Bengals change coaches. I want to know why you didn't put a team in Cincinnati, because we haven't had a professional football team here since 1990. <laughs> whoa, whoa. Um, 
That's an inside no. joke. Don't answer that, Oliver, please. <laughs> That's not an inside joke. Everybody gets that because Cincinnati's become one. So, <laughs> And I'm a Bengal season ticket holder for like the first 47 years, so I have a right to make that joke. I mean, so um, going back, Mike brought up a good point I wanted to ask you about because, you know, I mean, I, I, I have a favorite quarterback who – just beat the heck out of two teams in Texas that make somewhere around the vicinity of $25 million a year. Um, you know, you may have a son that does something similar to that, too. Is 300000 going to get you a product on the field that, that Vince McMahon and the XFL is going to be happy with? Well, I think that's a, a very fair question. So, ultimately, you know, we won't be able to, uh, you know, financially compete with, with the contracts that, you know, that the NFL – uh, you know, top quarterbacks are signing, whether, it, you know, it's, it's Aaron Rodgers or Matt Ryan or whomever, right? Um, but we do believe that we can compete, uh, you know, salary-wise with those guys who are effectively at the NFL minimum salary, which I think now is 400000 Of course, it goes up with, you know, additional years of service or, you know, with the salaries that, uh, that are being paid to uh, players, Right on the practice squad, you know, which is basically uh, seven or eight thousand, you know, per week, right? So practice squad guy is, you know, over the course of a full season, you know, maybe he's only in the hundred, the mid, you know, hundred twenty, hundred thirty, hundred forty thousand dollar range. So we believe we can compete with with guys uh, financially that are in those positions, and those will be the types of guys that we'll go after. The one I think big benefit that we have. And it's, 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 I, I don't want to understate it at all because I think it's legitimate, but is to tell these guys, listen, um, we can compete with your you know, practice squad salary or your, you know, your, your minimum NFL minimum salary, but we can offer you something that nobody else, right, including the NFL, can offer, which is the opportunity to play 10 games. And you know, having, having worked at NFL Europe for a number of years you know, through the 90s, you know, I literally witnessed a guy like Kurt Warner or Jake Delhomme, or John Kitna, or Brad Johnson, who won a Super Bowl, you know, as did Kurt. These guys came over to Europe, played 10 games, right? Relatively short season, just like ours, played 10 games. And those 10 games, under fire, you know, they, got, they, they have film, right? Teams can watch them. Those 10 games help those guys either resurrect their NFL career, like Kurt, who was you know, totally out of the league at that point. You know, he was famously shelving, you know, grocery store, uh, or stocking grocery right. store shelves. And now Hall know, of Fame quarterback, yeah. Bouncing around the arena league, and now he's you know, in the Hall of Fame. Um, right. or, or that extended their NFL career. You know, a lot of guys were on, on right. the practice squad at that point, got sent over to Europe to play 10 weeks. So, you know, we have a pretty, I think, you know, strong argument to these guys to say, hey, we will, you know, we will provide – uh, you the opportunity to to uh, you know either resurrect your NFL career or you know extend your deal for two or three or four years you know with with game time game time is critical and you know as a backup quarterback uh, no matter where you are as a practice squad guy you're just not going to get that that game time right it's very but very- it seems a little counterproductive because you you've made a point in every article you put out that you do not want to be a feeder system for the NFL so you talk about extending a career I mean are you looking at picking up aging veteran quarterbacks or are you looking at saying, you know, we're going to go to college and we're going to find the kid who's not a Heisman candidate, who we think has got a great arm, has a great mind, um, has been coached well at that position. What's your mind? Do you have a mindset on that? Are you just going to you see what's out there? Or I think, yeah, I think we want to go young and develop or do we want to go old and sustain? Well, I think initially yeah, what we've done is, is looked at, you know, all the, so the veterans, but this, this includes, you know, one- and two-year veterans, relatively young guys who are on the practice squad rosters. There's, there's a limited time period you can be in the practice squad, right? And, you know, if you're fighting to get in that 53-man roster with most, most teams only carrying two quarterbacks, that's also tough, right? Because there's not a lot of turnover, right, with your starting quarterback and, and with your backup quarterback, you know, traditionally. So, you know, we'll be looking at those guys who are one, two, three-year vets in, in the National Football League. Again, many of those guys are at the minimum, right? You know, they're fifth or sixth or, or seventh round picks or in some cases free agents. Uh, we'll also take a look at the college kids coming up. You know, the, the game to a certain degree I think is being, has been democratized at the college level. You've got incredible quarterbacks like Kyler Murray, not that he would, you know, be a target of ours, 
but you got guys like him that are five foot ten, <laughs> you know, tearing it up, winning the Heisman Trophy. You know, the NFL may look at him and say, well, as good of an athlete as he is, you know, will, will he make it in the league? But there's a whole bunch of guys that are in that category because you know the college game has sort of changed so much. It's now a little bit, you know, it's different than it. Than not everybody is six foot four, you know, and has that sort of stature that traditionally the NFL has has wanted. So, short answer to your question, Mike, is that we'll, you know, we'll look at both veterans that uh, are in that position where we think we can financially compete and offer them game time, right? That's that's obviously very important. Uh, but we also think that the, there very well could be some young guys in college coming up who, you know, for whatever reason, just don't fit, you know, that NFL model. I think of you know, the quarterback at UCF this past year, the kid who ended up, uh, you know. Yeah, McKenzie Milton. Yeah, having a pretty serious injury. You watch him play. He's fun to watch, right? Yeah. You know, very exciting, you know. But does he have the stature, right? Does he have the size to, you know, to make it in the league? I don't know, you know. Well, it's not does he have the size or stature to make it in the league. Will his size and stature hinder him from giving him a a chance? That's right. That's right. And and my my other question is this. Would you look at the CFL at all? Because there's guys in the CFL that I think are better than some of the NFL starters, guys like Bo Levi Mitchell, Trevor Harris, Mike Riley. Um, there's a lot of guys up there can play. Are those guys that you would consider pursuing? They are. They are. The, you know, the, the, the CFL has obviously a little bit of a different game. You know, there's plenty of quarterbacks that have uh, you know, made the transition very well, including you know, guys like Warren Moon that I played with way back in the day, but, but you know, much many more recent, you know, uh, players that came down from the CFL. So uh, we've got our eye on a handful of guys up in the CFL as well. So I think what you'll see is really, you know, a combination. Of, there'll be a few older guys, you know, that have a little bit of mileage on them. There'll be uh, maybe some younger guys that, uh, you know, are, have not, you know, spent any time in the National Football League. So uh, we're flexible enough, I think, and our coaches are going to be flexible enough to, you know, to identify those guys. What we really need to make sure is that we've got, you know, quarterbacks, because I think we'll be – much like the NFL, a quarterback-driven league, that we have quarterbacks that you know are capable of of not just playing well, but sort of being you know leaders and organizing the offenses. You know, with a 30-second clock and, and more of a fast-paced game and a couple of innovations that we're thinking about. You know, we need guys who you know who uh, can kind of comprehend all of that, right? You know, sort of the old field general, uh, because I think there'll be a, a bit more responsibility on our quarterbacks and maybe even in, uh, you know, in, in, in the national football league. So that's, that's going to be important for us, you know, and it, sort of that experience and situational awareness and intelligence will, will be certainly important as we, as we look at the guys we're planning to sign. All right. So when you look at your head coaches, then are you going to look more for offensive guys that maybe can help develop a young quarterback over a defensive head coach? Oh, uh, not necessarily. I mean, I think, you know, you, you look at, at, at head coaches that have had success, you know, whether it's major college ball or in the NFL, and, you know, you got some guys who are offensive guys. you got some guys who grew up on the defensive, you know, side of the ball. I think at the end of the day, most coaches realize, you know, where they may have a blind spot. And if they're a defensive guy, you know, they, they've kind of stocked up with strong offensive, you know, coordinators and strong offensive coaches. So I, we're, we're not going to – you know, we, we want a fast-paced game. We want coaches that are that have some experience in, in coaching in that sort of uh, up-tempo environment, right? Uh, and they, you know, as, as, if you look, you know, and kind of really do a close study, uh, you'll see guys come from you know both sides of the ball, and and even you know guys who kind of grow up from the, you know the special team side of the game. Um, so ultimately, we want the up-tempo game, but I think we can achieve that, you know, with with coaches from a you know, variety of different backgrounds. Some guys with pro experience, obviously. Some guys that really have more experience on the on the college side. So I, I think that that as well is 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 fairly open, right? In terms of there isn't one specific uh, sort of uh, you know model that we're that we're following on the coaches side. We want guys that are going to work hard. They're going to embrace this opportunity. That are going to help you know develop the profile of our franchise in, in each one of the markets. Uh, and, and are flexible enough to uh, to adapt a little bit because you know let's be honest this is a startup league, and you know our facilities won't be uh, quite practice facilities won't be quite as nice as you know what they may have been used to if they were you know coaching in the National Football League or at major college. So we we need guys who've got some flexibility as well. Right, Steve. Yeah, that was quite. That was going to be my next area I wanted to go to because you're starting to announce some of the stadiums you're going to play in, like Globe Life Park, which you say is the old Texas Rangers 
ballpark. Um, you're going to use Houston, University of Houston. Do you have a target number that you're looking to – you want to average? Um, I mean, because I know I like the Chargers out here at StubHub. You know, that's a 30,000-seat, 35,000-seat soccer stadium, and they can't fill it. Los Angeles can't fill StubHub with the Chargers, and the Chargers are a potential Super Bowl team. Um, yeah, do, you, do you have a number of what you think you need to be at in the court size stadium you want to be that makes you look like on TV that, you know, hey, we're, we're viable, we're, we're, we're filling seats? So you have, a, have you thought about that, or what's your thoughts on that? So we, as you can imagine, as you put, you know, sort of budgets together, right, we, we've contemplated what, what kind of a legitimate, realistic budget number there is for, you know, for tickets. And you know, we believe we can sell 20,000 tickets, you know, average 20,000 sold tickets per, per game. Uh, we'll do better than that, I believe, in some of the markets. And in, 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 on, in other marketers, who, you know, certainly depending on weather, we may not you know, do as well. But we believe on average uh, that we can sell 20,000 per game. Uh, we're also right now in the process of uh, scaling the building, which basically means you know, figuring out what your ticket prices are and what sections and and how that all sort of comes together, working you know very closely with, you know, with the operators of these various venues. And we've got a, as I, as you know, we've got a, a, an interesting, I think, collection of venues. We've got, you know, some N- NFL buildings, obviously in Seattle, uh, even down in StubHub. You mentioned the Chargers. Uh, I, I, I love that little building. I've been down there numerous times. I haven't seen the Chargers play in there, but uh, I've seen a, a lot of events. That's a really a nice size, and I. Something tells me the charges are about to fill it up, <laughs> you know, because yeah, it's they change. very well could host some playoff games down there. Uh, I think, you know, the, you, you mentioned Globe Life. I think that could be one of our neatest, coolest venues because we are ultimately going to be the, you know, the first tenant in that building when the Texas Rangers move out after the upcoming baseball season. And that's going to get retrofitted a little bit, uh, you know, by the Texas Rangers, obviously. And, and we're really – you know, that, that, that's going to be our home down there. And I think that uh, market, which is just, you know, gaga over football, I think we can do very well uh, in there. You know, Houston is our one college venue, the University of Houston, uh, but that's a relatively new, I think it's three or four years old, right? It's very nice size right next to downtown. Uh, you know, we've got, we've got some interesting uh, venues, but I think, uh, you know, we, we, we're in that $20,000 range in terms of our, of our expect 20,000 seat range, sorry, in terms of our expectation uh, in terms of fans, but I think we'll do uh, better in a, in, in a number of the markets. All right. Now, my question is: I see on LinkedIn, I see all these former players that played for me, you know, sharing that you know they're filling out to play for the XFL. How seriously are you guys taking the LinkedIn with players and coaches putting their stuff on there? Oh, that's you know that's that's the way that uh, people communicate nowadays. We're using LinkedIn, you know, in a number of different spaces. A lot of you know, executive recruiting, right? And now that we've got our, our franchises, you know, named and, and located, right, in these eight markets, we're using uh, LinkedIn and a number of other, you know, sort of online services to, to help staff up, right? We've got to hire team presidents, public relations directors, ticket sales folks, you name it, right? Um, I know that uh, uh, some of the head coaches that I have talked to, you know, that are interested in coaching in our league, potential head coaches interested in coaching in our league, they're using, you know, LinkedIn as well to, Sort of try to figure out what kind of staffs they would put together, right? If if they do get the uh, the job offer from us, so you know we we take it very seriously because that's that's really the way people you know are communicating nowadays. All right, I think Risley was looking for a job too. <laughs> no, he he was an all American quarterback. He keeps telling me so. Yeah, so, you well, know. you know, no, I, I the first person I thought of, Oliver, you got to go get is Doc Strock. The greatest backup quarterback in the history of backup quarterbacks. Got paid over a million dollars a year, suntan, sat behind Dan Marino at Miami with a clipboard in his hand. He got more face time than Dan Marino did, and he did nothing for, for how many years at Miami. So, Oh, Don Stock was a good quarterback now. Don't be yeah, ripping on him. No, 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 no. He was a Virginia Tech played. guy, if I remember correctly. Right. But I always remember they always used to say the greatest job in the history of – Sports is being Don Strzok because you're backing up Dan Marino. Oh, I remember he, Don Strzok when he was almost 40 years old, walking out on the Cleveland Stadium and winning a game to put the Browns in the playoffs in the late 80s. Yeah, that's right. No, yeah. I, I remember that as well. He, he, in fact, he coached for us when I was over in NFL Europe. Don was uh, coached at least a couple of years over there. Good guy. Very, yeah, no. very, very nice guy. You have to be a certain age to remember Don Strzok, and, and I, I do. I remember 
Well, it's unfortunate that all three of us remember him then, huh? (laughs) Yeah, we're really aging. We're we're dating ourselves big time. Yeah. Uh, Hey, at least I was in, I think, you know, middle school when Oliver was playing for West Virginia, so. Yeah. Uh, and I was uh, also in middle school when Steve was playing for IU. So there you where go. are you going to get? And this, this is an important question. I mean, because I I watched it against the Cowboys and Colts because it was a flag happy day. Where are you getting your referees from? How are you developing those guys? I mean, that's that's an important part of what we're doing. No, it, it, How it are absolutely you developing is developing your referees. No, that, that's that's a great question, and 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 refereeing right is is a hugely important yeah. part of our game because we want to. You know, this whole idea of up-tempo, you know, fewer interruptions, fewer stoppages, right, more flow, more rhythm in the game. I mean, a lot of that's controlled by, you know, by our referees. So uh, we think we've got, you know, a pretty neat opportunity because virtually every referee, whether they're pro guys or college guys, you know, they have the spring off, right? They're not working. They're not booked, you know, with their, you know, with their, uh, you know, sort of fall responsibilities. So uh, it's going to be incumbent upon us to, choose the right referees at the end of the day you know we're going to have to have four you know four crews right with four games every weekend and you know right. there's a handful of things that we're planning to do differently with our referees are still obviously hugely you know important but we we want to make sure that you know that we simplify the rules that you know we we come up with some standards with our referees where they're more likely than not to keep the flag in their pocket right uh, that's important as well you know you mentioned it, Steve. I watched the game as well as you can imagine this past Sunday, and there were just some bad yeah. calls, and then there were makeup calls that right. are almost yeah. as bad. You know, I, I yeah. get the reason you want to do a makeup call, but right. also not. There, there was the pass interference on T.Y. Hilton, and then the next play down, they call holding defensive holding on Dallas. I, said, I looked at my wife. My wife looked at me and said, "That's a makeup call." I mean, no, yeah, totally. They, I mean, they, they blew the, the call on T.Y. Let's make it up now. And there's so much of that that goes on. It, it's you know. It's frustrating, but it, it basically, you know, because you played at that level, they could call holding on every single play if they wanted to. Well, they, they you know, I, I think that's fairly accurate. You, if you really watch closely, whether it's, you know, offensive line play, whether it's, you know, linebackers right. and corner, you know, trying to cover guys. I mean, the, 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 the game clearly, you know, advantages the, the offense. Yeah. Right? So, you know, we're going to try to figure out what let, let's allow a certain amount of hand-to-hand combat. Right. right. Yeah. You know, from a cornerback and a wideout, or a linebacker and in a in a tight end. I mean, because it's it's happening anyway, and there's really not that much you can do about it. So it's almost sort of like you know, uh, in 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 uh, in the law, there's evidentiary standards. You guys might be familiar with this, right? You know, there's a preponderance of the evidence that's 51 percent. There's clear and convincing evidence that's maybe 75 percent. And then there's beyond a reasonable doubt, which is probably 95 percent. So we want to sort of raise the standard. In terms of what you know, what the referees uh, um, are supposed to call, right, and sort of make it a you know a little bit of a higher standard, so that you know they're avoiding what what everybody calls the ticky tacky stuff, right? And we've all we've all seen it, uh, we've all sort of experienced it, we've all you know have our had had our anguish about that, you know, as, as fans. So we're going to try to get guys who are willing to sort of you know take a sort of a second and a fresh look at at at, at refereeing. And try to you know move that standard up, really, so we don't have you know thirty or forty flags a game because that does break up the the rhythm and the flow of the game. Well, the so thing what that the drives me nuts is, is you see a guy ball. break a touchdown run, and there's a yeah. hole twenty yards yeah. behind it, and they throw the flag. They I think if it flag, doesn't yeah. affect the play, you want to avoid that. Yeah, yeah. But I think that's important, Oliver. I think I think really that's what will separate you out. Is it more loose calling and, and let let the guys play? Let them, you know. I'm from the Big Ten, and the Big Ten, we always, the, the Big Ten always let us play. You go to the ACC and it's piggy tag fouls every time you turn around. I, I think you want to get loose play, let guys go at it, let them use their talents and not just throw. I, I mean, it was frustrating for the Colts Cowboys on both sides of the fence and, you know, to see how many flags were thrown. Like, that, that, that's not a relevant flag to throw. Yeah, so no, I, I, I'm, I'm glad I, I you're thinking about this. that. I don't disagree. We're, we're spending a good bit of time on it. Uh, we've had uh, lots of conversations with, you know, various sort of folks that have a lot of experience in that space, you know, both NFL as well as major college ball. It's not easy. I'll, I'll say this. It's a tough, you know, being a referee, given the speed of the game and the, you know, how quick these decisions have to be made, it's, it's, not, it's not easy at all. Uh, but it's obviously for us something that's very important because we, we feel as though we can't really – 
fully reimagine the game and get that up-tempo, fast-paced, fewer stop right. game, you know, without making sure the referees are a part of that, right? So, uh, and it has to be consistent. That's, that's the most important thing. It's got to be consistent from one game to the next, this, one week to the next, you know, in terms of the season and what players, you know, are allowed to do and what they can't do. So, will we, will we be perfect? No, uh, but we're, we're going to spend a lot of time and effort, you know, as, as we get into the spring of, of 19 and start to identify our referees to make sure that the, they understand sort of the viewpoint that we have and are, and are you know, really committed to it as, a, as we go into the 2020 launch. Yeah. And, and, you know, that's the thing that people don't realize is that when we watch games on TV, we, we get the benefit of slow motion, instant replay. These referees are making split-second decisions, you know, based on a, 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 an eye-corner observation many times. And what they think they see and what they end up really seeing on a replay are many times different things, and then we, we blame them for that. But they're doing it not at the same pace that we're watching it. And yeah, no, I agree. It's it, it hard. I mean, any fan should just, as, as I'm sure you guys have done many times, just any fan should go down to the sideline just for five plays. All right? That's all you need. And you'll realize, you know, how, how fast everything happens and how, you know, how challenging it is uh, for these referees. But, again, that, that's, that's no excuse. We, we've got to get it right. Right. And we also know you as a quarterback, me as a basketball player, I knew how to skirt referees and, and how to hold and grab and pinch and do the things I needed to do to irritate my opponent. With, Wait a second, you used to pinch people, referee. Steve? What? You used to pinch people? <laughs> oh, God, yeah, all the time. Bird taught me that. Larry really? Bird taught me how to pinch. Oh, Larry Bird didn't teach you anything. Yeah, he did. In, in You're making it up. Play, You never did. even talked to Larry Bird. Come on. Larry Bird yeah, wasn't, pin, wasn't teaching Steve Ridley how to pinch people. Jeez. Move on. Attention. <laughs> go ahead. I just I couldn't let that go. Just a grown man pinching no, another grown I, man. Just your turn to ask a question. <laughs> <laughs> but when you look at this, and you talked about you're, you're going to go get the head coach, you're going to go get the quarterback. When can we look at? And are you guys going to do like a territorial draft for each, you know, area or overall draft, or exactly how are you guys going to stock the teams? So we're we're not uh, planning on any sort of territorial advantage, if you will, or, or connection. Um, I think it's important that you know we have sort of complete transparency in in how players are distributed, right, to the various teams. I think that's the fairest way to do it. So we, we envision some sort of a, a, a quarterback slash skilled position draft that'll, that'll take place in the spring, and then we expect a, a much larger draft to be early fall, you know, after the, the, the NFL cutdown. So you know, we looked at this idea of you know, do you take a West Coast player and put him in LA, you know, or in Seattle, uh, and eventually you know some of those West Coast players will be drafted by LA or Seattle and be there anyway, but. Uh, we think it makes really more sense to allow coaches the complete freedom, you know, to, to you know, stock their rosters, build their rosters the way they see fit. Keep in mind that, you know, our, our head coaches are effectively uh, head coach slash general manager. Think Al Davis back in the 70s, head coach, GM of the Raiders, you know. So they've, yeah. got, they've got coaching responsibility, of course, but also have, you know, talent evaluation responsibility. So, you know, this, the league will sign the player pool, uh, but, you know, the, the individual coaches will have to, you know, kind of create their own sort of grades and their own, you know, research uh, on, on each of these players in terms of who, who they want, you know, on their roster. So that's, that's very important. And it's interesting, as I've been talking to a lot of these potential head coaches, they sort of love the idea that they're not just, you know, there to coach, right, but they're also there for, you know, talent evaluation purposes. That's not – sort of something that they necessarily have had a lot of experience with in the NFL, right? You know, where the GM basically and the pro personnel guys decide on, on the talent and you're just really a coach, right? You're creating the game plans, et cetera. You might have some input on, on draft day, but uh, ultimately that's not, you know, your full responsibility. So we're giving each of these head coaches really the full coaching and the full, you know, talent evaluation responsibility, which I think for a lot of these guys is very attractive. So when you staff each one of these teams, are you going to staff them with actual scouts also, or is it just going to be just on the coaching staff? 
So the, the bulk of the talent evaluation will be done by the head coach and, and his assistant coaches, right, his coordinators and his, and his position coaches. There'll be uh, some talent evaluation uh, folks, personnel on, on, on each team, uh, but that'll be relatively limited. There, there will not be, you know, sort of a high-priced general manager, if you will, uh, with each club who is determining what, you know, what, what, uh, what talent is going to be drafted. So we're leaving that responsibility to the head coach, and again, it's a little bit of a throwback to uh, you know 70s and even into the early 80s, when you often had a head coach you know take on the role as well as a, a general manager. Yeah, which I think is the best way to do it, anyways, because you want the coach to have the players he wants. I don't understand why they do it other ways, but well, I think particularly early on in in, in a league's you know history, right? Uh, because uh, you, you've got to you got to the coach is going to be running you know a certain system. You know, offensively, defensively, and you know, that coach needs to really have the guys that he wants, right? You know, given the draft, he can't get everybody you want, but you know, he's uh, he, he'll be fully responsible for stocking that that roster, and that's I think you know I think something that uh, makes a lot of sense you know to a football fan. Yeah, the coach, you know, he's he's responsible for the success of that team, not just on game day, you know, but the guys that are on the 45 man roster or on the seven man practice squad roster. All right, Steve. Yeah, are, are there kind of turning things just a little bit different direction? Going back, um, are, are there certain rules or situations that you and your committee have looked at, like with let's just say the NFL, that you say we could do better? Say like eliminating kickoffs or something like that. Are there, or is it too early to even talk about this yet? Where there are things that you say we think we could do this better than the NFL does it. Uh, in our rules package, in the way we effectively run our games, are, are there two or three things you want to address or can address or planning to address? Well, there are probably a dozen sort of modifications, changes, tweaks, whatever words you want to use that we're looking at, right, that would, that, that would, would differentiate us from the National Football League. Some of those are, are significant. Uh, one of them is – um, you know, is a, a, a different version of the kickoff. I mean, right now we're seeing the kickoff return vanish before our very eyes. Yeah. You can, you can sit and watch, you know, full NFL games and even college games and not see a kickoff return anymore because every kicker is arguably good enough to, you know, knock it into or out of. Yeah, that and they've yeah. moved them up five and ten yards over the last few years. Well, and I, I think they said there's only been like three or four successful onside kicks in the NFL this year so far. Hadn't it been some, there's some low number like that where it's so taken out of the game. So go ahead. I, I didn't yeah, want to so we got. Go so we're, we're looking at a, at a different kickoff, and we believe that this different kickoff that we're, you know, we're looking at and have already tested with some junior college kids, we think – that will keep the kickoff return in the game. We think the kickoff return is one of the most exciting plays in football, right? Uh, it doesn't happen all that often, even in sort of the old days, but we think it's a, you know, it's a play worth keeping. So uh, we've, we've designed a, a kickoff and a kickoff return that we think makes sense. We also think it's going to be better for the players in terms of health and safety. The reason the kickoff has been sort of the kickoff return has been vanishing is it is the single most dangerous play the way it's used now with, you know, with uh, all these guys running down the field full steam and then, you know, colliding basically with, with the kickoff return guys. So uh, we've, we've, we've got it, this idea. We've tested it uh, the last couple of weeks with some junior colleges. Uh, we're going to continue testing it in the, in the spring. Uh, we're going to get, once we hire our head coaches, get their feedback on that. So there's probably about a dozen or so things that, that, that will, uh, when you watch our game, will, will you know, differ from what the NFL has. We'll be looking at a 30-second play clock as opposed to a 40-second play clock, right? So, you know, one of the things we think we can do is have this up-tempo game. And uh, but to have the up-tempo game, of course, you need to you know force teams uh, to have a shorter play clock so they get in and out of the huddle or not even huddle and get up to the line of scrimmage, call the play, and and, and move. Uh, we're thinking of having an eighth referee uh, whose only job it is is to spot the ball. That's something we're borrowing from uh, the colleges where some of the conferences have added an eighth referee who only has one responsibility, doesn't ever throw a flag, just spots the ball. So if you're going to have the hurry-up, up-tempo offense, you need to have the ball spotted, right, and get the offense up there and, and, and ready to roll. Uh, so there's a, there's a handful of, uh, of things that we're looking at. We've even borrowed an idea from the CFL, uh, which is on a punt, 
no fair catch allowed, but there's a halo rule, right? Yeah. In the CFL, they have the halo rule, and I don't know if you ever watch much CFL, but we've got lots of clips of the halo rule in effect. It's actually pretty cool. Oh, it's a great <laughs> rule. I mean, we do a them. weekly CFL show with, you remember Robert Drummond? Yeah, yeah. He played Syracuse, player. played for the Eagles. Yeah, I, I love the CFL. I love the rules. I'm not big on that just a couple downs to get a first down, but – Overall, I think the rule is a great rule. It brings a lot to the game because even now it seems like about 80% of all punts are fair caught also. Yeah, so that's, you know, that's, that's an example of something that, uh, that we're looking at. Um, you know, the, there's something that's really cool that you, you occasionally see in the CFL. Uh, in fact, Doug Flutie, when he was playing up there, you know, said that uh, the, the Argonauts team he was playing for tried to do this whenever they could. But you, 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 you're the punt return guy. You catch the ball and you immediately, right? You don't take off running. You throw it behind you. You lateral it to a teammate, you know, uh, yeah. which is a really exciting play. I'm sure you've seen a couple of these, you know. Uh, yeah, actually, I remember his Argonauts team with Pinball Clemens doing that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, you know, uh, w- w- there are, listen, I, I think at the end of the day, the, the game of professional football is in great shape. I mean, I, the, the NFL games are exciting. So many of them come down to the last, you know, last drive or two by each team. I think it's really being played at, at a very high level. You know, nonetheless, we think there are some places where we can, we can make improvements, right? We can better the game. We can, you know, speed it up a little bit, which is the whole up-tempo concept. Can I make a suggestion? New. Sure, absolutely. I have a suggestion. All right, and I've got two things. Number one, the CFL has a rule also on the line of scrimmage where the defensive line has to be a yard off the ball. Yeah, um, I, I, the great thing about that is safety. And my other suggestion would be four player safety, four offensive linemen. Put the offensive linemen in a two point stance. Yeah, so we've we've tested both the you know abolishing the three point stance. We've tested that uh, a little bit with these JUCO kids. We've also taken a look at the one yard off the ball. You know, unfortunately, there isn't any data from the CFL. Right? They've never had sort of a control group. <laughs> you know. Because they've always had the, you know, they've been doing the one yard off the ball for yeah. a long time. You think about it, and conceptually it makes sense that there should be reduced, you know, head-to-head contact, you know, right, with, with the snap. Yeah, but the thing about the CFL is they're one of the leagues that still will not admit that CTE is caused by football. Yeah, well, that, I'm not, I, I'm not uh, familiar with their stance on that, but I, I have talked to their, one of their vice presidents who oversees sort of the health and safety aspects and, and, you know, a fascinating thing would be, you know, a study looking at one yard off the ball, looking at, you know, abolishing the three-point stance, right, with it, maybe everybody except the center, you know. Uh, but, but also then in the CFL, if you have 12 guys on a wider field, what does that mean in terms of physics and safety, yeah. you know? Uh, but, you know, based on my discussions with some of their league Officials, they they really don't have any data to you know to kind of show you know what. Um, yeah, because it's always been that way. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, but that's that's a good point. That's, that's the one yard off the ball and the you know the two point stance. Well, I, have, I can give you my study, way. Oliver. I coached my son's high school team, and the last two years we went to the offensive line being in a two point stance. We have not had one concussion with an offensive lineman. The two years before that, we had six. So what what's been the uh, what's been the result if you know it's a third and one and you, and you just got to pound it in you know between the tackles or, or uh, the result is this we played for a national championship this year we were eleven and two we are a homeschool Christian team that beat a ton of public school teams doing it and basically the way I have my offensive line block is kind of a zone block. Right, But what we do is when we come off the ball, we react whatever the defensive player, whatever way he's going is the way we take him, and the running back reads the back of the blockers. Okay. And we've had a lot of success with that. It also helped us because most years we're not as big as the teams we play, and it gives us a chance to get angles. And the reason I went with that is, you remember Jim McNally, the old Bengals and Giants offensive line coach? I had him on my show like two or three years ago. And we started talking offline about it, and I brought up the idea of two-point stance. And he sent me some videos, and he said, yeah, he said, I think you can be more successful blocking this way than just trying to pound the ball straight ahead. And the thing is, my son, my one son's an offensive lineman, so the safety aspect was huge to me. 
but we did it, and we've actually blocked better that way. Interesting. Yeah, that's good. That's good. That's good experience. Yeah. So the, the fascinating thing about all of this, right, is is the games I think being played at a very high level, but you know the health and safety aspect is important, and I think you know sort of innovating. Uh, in ways that that improve health and safety is is good for the game at at all levels, right? You know, professional, college, high school, you know, down to you know down to the little kids who just get started at age you know twelve or whatever. So I'm, I'm yeah, I'm, I'm, you know, I think we're certainly open uh, and we'll continue to be open, right? Uh, we, we yeah, don't, we're, we're also very is, sensitive. We're also very sensitive. And I think this is important to mention to not change too much at once, right? Yeah. Uh, because, you know, our players are going to be guys who played college ball. It's like that every year. The first two or three preseason games in the NFL, some college rookie defensive back, you know, forgets that, you know, it's, it's not, you know, you know a receiver's not down when he falls to the ground. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and the guy gets up and runs for 60 more yards for a touchdown. The guy says, oh, shoot, I forgot. You know, so we want to make sure that, you know, there's not too much thinking that has to go on because we believe, I believe, players play better when they get into that zone. And we don't want them back there, you know, trying to catch a punt and not knowing if they're in the, you know, major college ball or, or the NFL or, or the CFL or the XFL. So that's, you know, that's something that's we're very sensitive to that as well. All right, Steve. Yeah, can can you? I, and it may be too early to. You're not willing to address this yet, but delivery of your product. I mean, streaming, cable, television networks. Do uh, you have any update on that that you can share? The what direction you're thinking about heading? I mean. Streaming's the way everything's going now. Yeah, streaming uh, is. What's your the thought way, process on that market? Yeah, streaming is the way everything is going, uh, and and we will ultimately have streaming capabilities for our games. But we think, uh, and maybe a, which is a little bit of an old school thought, but I think it's absolutely you know appropriate and strategically you know the right thing. We think that exposure you know is ultimately going to be uh, the most important sort of single factor uh, in terms of our strategy for you know, for the, for the launch of our league for the first couple, three, four years. And that, that really, you know, means traditional television, linear television, both broadcast and cable. So uh, we're very close to announcing our, our broadcast relationship. I think uh, folks will be, you know, very pleased. Uh, football fans will be very pleased with our partners, you know, who are both partners that have uh, extensive experience, you know, at the highest level in, in professional football. So we're, we're, we're very excited about that. We think at the end of the day that, you know, getting exposure, getting people to sort of watch our game, you know, enjoy the differences in our game, watch good, crisp football, see our players, our coaches, we think that that ultimately is, is you know, most important, um, you know, and that's why we, we really have focused primarily on, on the linear package. We will have streaming, you know, but as a startup, it's kind of, you have to be a little bit careful to limit yourself to, to streaming because, you know, people need to sort of find out, if, if uh, you know, the game is something that they want to watch, right? So we think linear is really uh, the way to go, and we're excited about our, our, our partnerships. We'll be announcing those rel- relatively soon. All right, Steve, you got anything else before we wrap it up? Um, well, yeah, you talk about streaming. I mean, you know, Disney, obviously, they're creating their own streaming channel now. They're, they're, they, they, you know, Disney's the monster in the world in terms of entertainment. You know, they're, they're bringing everything back in-house. All the Disney products are coming back in and only going to be available pretty much on the Disney streaming channel. So it will eventually get there. You're right. Um, and you can thank Mark Cuban for that, basically. Yeah, well, um, he, he started the whole thing. It's amazingly He started the whole thing, yeah. You know, well, streaming you know, streaming is clearly, is clearly yeah. important, you know, and there's no question about that. And as, You know, as this generation gets a little bit older and they – you know, you get accustomed to watching, you know, games or bits of games on, you know, on handheld, on smartphones and all that, you know, streaming is going to only get bigger and get, you know, become a more significant part of, of the broadcast package. Uh, well, we, all, we also think that kind of, like, kind of what, kind of what the NCAA did a very good job of. And I, have you thought, given thought as to how the XFL can become a family experience? Like, I know you guys are going to control the franchises, so, like, tailgating, is there going to be kind of like the NCAA has, you know, the, the, the town, the NCAA town there, wherever the Final Four is being played. I know I've been a part of it um, as a player and as a parent. Um, are you looking at saying, you know, we're going to take your Sunday and we want you to, your family to come and experience everything. We're going to get tailgating set up for you. We're going to have this all done, entertainment before the game and things like that. Have you looked at that part of the game, too? 
We have, we have, right? So, you know, a, a, a football games historically are big events in, in people's lives. You know, sure. I, I'm always amazed. Well, they, yeah. You got you got people showing up at you know seven eight a.m. to tailgate for a you know one p.m. kickoff or a noon kickoff. It's it's awesome, you know, and and so we we certainly want to replicate that. Uh, we will encourage tailgating, obviously, you know, at our venues. There'll, there'll be as you mentioned, sort of organized tailgating spaces, you know, uh, with music and kids stuff and you know all the fun stuff that uh, that people expect, you know, from from professional football. Uh, WWE, you know, if you've been to any of the any of their events, does a remarkable job in venue of of keeping people entertained, uh, and you know, so we 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 get to lean on that expertise and experience to make uh, you know create events that really are you, friendly. I have been to a WWE event, and they are the most fun thing in the world to go to. Yeah, they're a blast. You, I mean, you, you go know, there whether, and you whether you're a wrestling fan, going on. yeah, whether you're yeah. a wrestling fan or not, or know sort of the, right. you know, yeah. the storyline doesn't matter. Just the, you understand the why Vince McMahon is yeah. Vince McMahon when you go to a WWE event in person. You don't get it on TV until you actually go to one. And then you're like, oh, my God, I understand why he's who he is. Yeah, yeah. So that's, figure that, it out. That, that's going to be a big part of our, you know, of, of, of the game day experience. And every, every one will be a little bit different, right? It's going to be different in Tampa than, than it will be in Seattle. But we think that, uh, you know, we think we're well equipped to really put on, you know, a, a, a fun, enjoyable, you know, pregame in-game and even perhaps post-game uh, event, right? That uh, because I think people expect that at the end of the day. I, I certainly do when I go to a you know an NFL game or a college game. I I expect to spend a little bit of time pre-game or post-game having having fun talking to friends, you know, all that sort of stuff. Well, like they always said, you know, nobody makes you feel better about spending money in the world than Walt Disney. You know, yeah. you spend more money than God going to a Disney uh, Disney World or Disneyland. But you, they make you enjoy every dollar you spend, and, and I think that's the key: is make people get feel like they're getting value for their money. And like I said, Disney wrote the book on that. So yeah. the, you know, and McMahon has done that with champs with WWE too, because like I said, I have been to one of their events. So well, that's a, that's a key that's a key component of you know of what we're what we're doing. We've got uh, thankfully yeah. time to kind of map that all out at our different venues and, and structure that. Uh, so that you know, that's I, I'm looking forward to that because that's that's actually a very fun part of you know putting on football games is is building those events that sort of transcend the game itself, but are, are just you know fun for for families for you know for groups that want to go out and spend time together uh, and and making it all affordable, right? That's 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 absolutely critical. Uh, you know, we we think that that you know we can offer affordable tickets, family packs, all those sorts of things that. You know, can make going to a professional football game not just fun, but you know, affordable and sort of realistic for folks that might be on on tight budgets. Yeah, I think that's the biggest thing because the NFL is not realistic anymore for it's most not. people. No, they don't. No, you're on your own. I mean, all that. That, that's why you see teams that are out of the playoff hunt now in a sixty feet, sixty thousand seat stadium, only say or only have twenty or thirty thousand people there. Right. I saw it this weekend in Cincinnati, but don't well, get me started on that. I think that. the NCAA got it right too, because you know, anytime you, like I said, anytime you can go to a Final Four or any type of NCAA event, now you've got NCAA City sitting there basically, which is a whole fan experience for everybody to come in and, and to partake farther than just going and sitting and watching a game. And the NCAA, you know, we all have issues with the NCAA from time to time, but they got that right. They, yeah. they that's a model that hopefully the XFL looks at and says. How do we incorporate this into what we're doing? What the NCAA has done? Yeah, no, ab- absolutely. I'm I'm very familiar with what the NCAA does. Yeah, I'm sure you, you know, are. And yeah. uh, they've they've done we've done the organization's done a really nice job. Certainly around Final Four and right you know, and, and, and March Madness of of developing you know an entire sort of you know just an awesome setup you know for for folks to have fun of all ages, quite honestly. Yeah, it, it and it is. And, and I am still looking for a dog-friendly golf course. Well, I'm not sure I can help you there. <laughs> <laughs> I want a place where I can go play 18 holes and have my two dogs ride along the golf cart with me and run. You know, and as long as I got doggy bags in the car that I can clean up the mess. You know, but it's like you see, you just the things. Just like you want to be inclusive. You want to get everything involved. So 
whatever. We're going off tangent. Mike, I'm done. <laughs> We're not going off tangent. I'm, You're going off tangent, now. Steve. I'm going to get back into the Colts here real quick if we aren't careful. <laughs> All right. Um, Oliver, I know we've had you for about an hour. I know you're a busy man, so we will let you go. I want to thank you for coming on. You're welcome anytime. We'd love to have you on in another month or two, especially when you announce the coaches. And tomorrow we're going to have Trevor Harris from the Ottawa Red Blacks on the show. So I got his phone number if you want to get a hold of him. That's nice. That's, that's a good call. I, I, appreciate, I appreciate the opportunity. Uh, thanks very much. Love what you guys do. All right. Thanks a lot, Oliver. All right. Take care. All right, guys. Take care. Yep. Go cold. Go cold. You bet, baby. (laughs) All right, guys. Remember, you can hear us tomorrow at noon. As of right now, it looks like Trevor Harris from the Ottawa Red Blacks may be our guest. If not, he'll be on later in the day with me and on the CFL show. But we're just going to do that to get Steve out of his comfort zone. Um, Tonight. Approximately 9 o'clock, Colin Hartman, Steve Risley, and myself with the Indiana Basketball Weekly Show after Indiana plays Central Arkansas. Make sure you check out Jim Coyle on the Indiana Sports Daily talk show on thegrillingtruth.net. You can get that at 9 o'clock in the morning on thegrillingtruth.net. You can hear all of our shows on Spotify, iHeartRadio, iTunes, TuneIn, Spreaker, Stitcher, wherever you find sports podcasts, you'll find The Grueling Truth. So for Oliver Luck, Steve Risley, I'm Mike Goodpastor. You've been listening to The Grueling Truth, where the legends speak.